So here's what I'd like to do in the time I have today. Uh, is, is first, uh, uh, since many of you are young and coming to this field uh, relatively recently, is to drive home the point that this is a field that has quite a trajectory. It, it didn't just arise in the last decade, but really has about a 50 or 60 year history, uh, including the medical aspects of the field. Uh, so I'd like to provide some advice as part of uh, this uh, presentation while still uh, talking about that evolution uh, over the uh, decades uh, since uh, the beginning of the field. Um, summarize where we are today, uh, no doubt throw out some personal perspectives that, that may generate questions and discussion and disagreements, uh, uh, but I look forward to that uh, uh, at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so many of you may have heard that uh, people try to date this field to about 1956 when there was a meeting held at Dartmouth College. Uh, it was about people interested in how one might simulate the intelligence of human beings uh, by computer. Uh, and it was this gentleman, uh, this is a much more recent picture than 1956, John McCarthy, uh, who at the time was uh, at MIT and who coined this phrase artificial intelligence. Uh, for the field. Obviously, there had been thinking about this for some time earlier, uh, uh, but that's when the name was first uh, brought up. That name has stuck. There have been efforts to change the name from time to time uh, over the intervening uh, half century, uh, but pretty much this name is the one that now sticks. So you'll, you'll hear machine intelligence used, you'll hear augmented intelligence used, uh, uh, but we will use the traditional AI that is now very much in vogue as well. And interestingly, although many people sort of think Alan Turing gets credit for creating the field, he never actually heard these words, artificial intelligence, didn't use them himself, uh, even though one often uh, uh, is tempted to point back uh, to his early work and the Turing test and so forth as, as being part of the uh, generation of the notion of computers with intelligent uh, behavior. Um, I also want to make it clear that machine learning, which we uh, think is such a huge part of AI today, is not new either. Uh, this was part from the very beginning in the, in the late 1950s. This gentleman, uh, Art Samuel, is a researcher at IBM Research. Um, and he got interested in getting a computer to learn how to uh, play a good game of checkers. He wasn't an expert in checkers himself, although he knew the rules. So he basically programmed the basic rules of checker and, and, and some uh, goal states into the machine. And then he had two copies uh, that played against each other and revised their approaches, their sc scoring functions, their strategies until not only could he not beat them at checkers, but nobody in the world was able to beat this program at checkers. Uh, there's, there's early articles about this. Uh, but I think this is the first really impressive example of a, of a computer program that learned uh, on its own in advance, having been guided by uh, a human programmer, uh, learned how to uh, uh, do something very, uh, that seemed very intelligent and, and, and thoughtful. So during the 1960s and 70s, the field really began to take off. There was work in uh, a wide variety of areas that we today associate still with artificial intelligence, obviously machine learning, the notion of neural networks that sort of arose from earlier work uh, defining the, the concept of perceptrons, uh, trying to do natural language processing, understanding human text and even speech, uh, and then just simulating the way in which human beings solve problems. Uh, and uh, by uh, the late 1960s, as I'll describe, the first uh, uh, efforts were made to try to apply these concepts in the biomedical arena. Uh, I would say that in the 1960s, there were probably three places uh, that uh, were where this AI field was getting going. Uh, obviously, this became a worldwide phenomenon later, but it really just started it at these three institutions. Uh, Carnegie Mellon University, CMU, which in those days was called Carnegie Tech, where Herb Simon and Alan Newell were the uh, nominal leaders of what was happening in the AI area. Herb Simon, um, an economist and psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics somewhat later. Uh, so two brilliant men, Alan Newell, also a psychologist, but very interested in 
human problem solving and the way in which computers might be used to simulate those. Marvin Minsky was at MIT and John McCarthy by the 1960s had moved from MIT to Stanford and was uh, uh, perhaps the most recognizable name during that decade uh, uh, in the AI area at Stanford. But by the mid uh, 1960s, there was an interesting project started uh, that is arguably the beginning of the medical or, or biomedical applications of artificial intelligence. These are four key players in that work. Uh, and interestingly, the two on the right are computer scientists, but the other two are not. Joshua Lederberg, a geneticist uh, who came to Stanford. This was all done at Stanford. Yeah, Joshua came from uh, uh, University of Wisconsin to Stanford to head the Department of Genetics. He, he came uh, very young, having just won the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology. Uh, and uh, so a young, brilliant guy who also happened to know quite a bit about computer programming and became intrigued with a problem that led him to team up with the other people on this slide. Carl Gerasi, a famous organic chemist on the faculty at Stanford, uh, instrumental in the development of birth control bills, so uh, uh, hormone uh, chemistry. Ed Feigenbaum, who came out of the Carnegie Tech world of computer science and after a stay at Berkeley for a few years came to Stanford where he became one of the faculty in computer science and quickly teamed up with Josh Lederberg on a problem I'll be describing in a moment. And a few years later, joined by Bruce Buchanan, who uh, uh, was another a key individual, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about Bruce uh, in a moment as well. Uh, so the Dendro project uh, dealt with organic chemistry. That's why uh, Carl Gerasi was so involved. And it dealt with uh, the challenge of uh, scientific hypothesis formation and discovery. Uh, the idea uh, that Josh Lederberg identified was, uh, could we help organic chemists to identify Un unknown organic molecules by analyzing the mass spectra of those molecules. Usually we you would know the uh, chemical structure, uh, excuse me, the chemical formula uh, of an unknown compound that could be determined pretty easily, but then there were literally often thousands of possible structures that would be associated with that formula and mass spectra were used to try to determine which of those structures uh, was uh, in fact the one for that compound. Um, so the expertise first of Jurassic, then of other chemists was encoded uh, in sets of rules and uh, had an amazing uh, uh, effective performance at determining the structure of these uh, compounds. Uh, where Bruce Buchanan got involved, uh, he came in and started working on this project and then developed the notion of metadendrol which was instead of trying to get this knowledge out of the heads of organic chemists, could we just provide lots of examples uh, of uh, organic compounds and known that had known structures and have uh, the, the, this new program called Metadendrol uh, uh, essentially learn the new rules of mass spectro spectroscopy interpretation. This project had a huge impact and, and was well recognized outside of uh, biomedical science because of the methods that were developed. So the computer science community as a whole was very aware of what was happening with the Dendro project. Um, after years of working on this and some related projects, Feigenbaum became known for having defined what he called uh, the knowledge is power principle. The idea being uh, what's captured in this quotation, uh, uh, he called it the knowledge principle stating that knowledge of the specific task domain in which the program is to do its problem solving is more important as a source of the power for competent problem solving than the reasoning method uh, that's actually employed. Uh, this notion that knowledge was a key element of what needed to, to be managed, uh, learned, uh, manipulated, and applied uh, was the core concept uh, for artificial intelligence research and practice at the time. So in medicine, in clinical medicine, which is how I got into this field, uh, there are three uh, programs, there were many programs, but there are three that have become particularly well-known and were influential during the 1970s uh, for the impact that they had on the evolution of the 
I'll briefly describe each of them. Uh, one of the main points is the fourth bullet on this slide, which is that all three of these programs develop new methods in order to solve their problems in medicine, and those methods could be generalized and used broadly even outside of medicine. So they fed back into the science of AI even while being motivated by biomedical problems. <clears throat> Uh, particularly uh, 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 effective and, uh, and well-known was the Internist One project developed at the University of Pittsburgh by a clinician named Jack Myers. He was the chair of medicine before he started working on this problem and very well-known nationally for his clinical acumen. Uh, he teamed up with a computer scientist named Harry Popel, and they developed uh, the first versions of this program that was designed literally to do um, diagnosis in internal medicine. It didn't do it probabilistically. It used a uh, uh, modeling process of the hypothetical deductive approach, which had become uh, described, I'll mention that more in a moment, uh, by those who were trying to understand how clinicians solve problems in medicine. Uh, and over the years, this program evolved uh, uh, with the assistance of Randy Miller, a medical student who then stayed on the faculty and became one of the key leaders on this project went on to become the chair of biomedical informatics at Vanderbilt University uh, several years later. But I'm citing here on this slide this article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 1982, in which they tested this program uh, literally on any clinical pathological conference that was published during a year uh, in, a, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, clinicians here will know that these are the most difficult problems in medicine and are used to challenge discussants and, and uh, residents and, and the like uh, to try to figure out what the explanation was for what was happening in the case. As it turned out, and this is one of the reasons it got published, is the program was able to do as well as the people that actually were taking care of the patient uh, and much better than trainees uh, on some of the most difficult cases in medicine spread across a wide variety of organ systems and the like. It wasn't like just for one narrow area of medicine, but for all of ad adult internal medicine later, it was expanded to handle pediatric. The next program I wanna mention is uh, this one from uh, Rutgers University called CASNET. Uh, the leaders of this group were Kazimir Klukowski and Saul Amarel. He was the, uh, Amaro was the chair of the department. Kaz was a developer of um, medical systems from uh, the University of Hawaii who had come to Rutgers and they combined uh, with a graduate student whose PhD work uh, was on this concept of a causal associational network for actually modeling uh, pathophysiologic states and how observations led you to determine what states might occur and use those uh, to reason as is kind of suggested by this diagram into the proper disease category. Uh, they worked in the area of uh, ophthalmology on glaucoma diagnosis, uh, and uh, this uh, whole approach to causal modeling uh, was picked up and used by many others uh, who were interested in AI at the time. And our program uh, at, at Stanford now was called the Meissen Project, I started working on it in 1972. I was a graduate student doing both an MD and a PhD at the time. And I teamed up with Stan Cohen, shown here on the left, who was the new chair of genetics after uh, Josh Lederberg left for Rockefeller University, and with Bruce Buchanan, who I mentioned earlier, who had been uh, with the Dendral Project. He became a, a, a key mentor for me uh, uh, on the computer science side. And Stan was... Uh, 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 helpful as a clinician who understood the problem that we identified, which was the diagnosis uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, management of uh, infectious diseases with a focus on bacterial infections in the blood uh, or the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the thesis document I've made available for some years, and you're welcome to download it or read portions of it if you wish at the website I've shown on this slide, my personal website. Now, what, one of the reasons this, this program got some attention was that it was, it was motivated by the notion that this knowledge is power notion, that it should be possible to encode the knowledge that was used by expert clinicians who tried to manage uh, infectious disease problems of the sort mice that was being designed for. Uh, 
but that the underlying reasoning didn't necessarily have to be specific to this domain. And so there was a creation of a program approach that largely used what's called backward chaining of production rules. Um, and then all the actual knowledge of the domain was put in this corpus of decision rules. Uh, so the program would use information provided by a clinician about a specific patient, apply the rules that say, so we were, uh, I was just trying to explain that there was a basis for giving explanations. And I'm going to keep emphasizing this notion of explanation throughout this talk. Uh, I assume everybody can see my slides again now. Is that right? Okay. So the key was having a, a facility for giving explanations and having a corpus of, 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 uh, of rules that could be translated into something that a user could understand. So although our rules looked uh, like Lisp code that was written in Lisp, they could be translated into English in a, in a form that a physician could understand. Uh, and this allowed them to get some persuasion about the validity of the advice that the program was offering. Now, at the time, there was a prevailing ass assumption that clinicians would use AI systems if the programs could be shown to function at the level of experts. And uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, paper I mentioned earlier in the New England Journal for internists uh, made that kind of effort when they published their paper. It was as good as the experts who cared for the patient. Um, uh, we wrote, did a similar study on mycin that showed that it functioned at the level of infectious disease specialists uh, in diagnosing uh, difficult cases and recommending therapy. Uh, and yet, uh, over time, it became clear that there was much more that was needed than simply um, excellent performance. And uh, I will be talking about that in some detail as the talk proceeds. Just want to say a few other words though about what the big topics were at the time. One was the whole issue of how to manage uncertainty. Many AI projects similarly uh, that, that had developed uh, uh, and had similar characteristics to these medical ones uh, were working in settings where there was not a lot of uncertainty about how something worked, for example. But in the human body and in uh, infections and other uh, diagnostic categories, there's a lot of uncertainty and medicine had to wrestle with uncertainty uh, in, in significant ways. So most of the systems had some kind of approach to how to, how to encode what one knew about the likelihood of a relationship holding in a given case. Um, uh, it was logical to start with Bayes' models, but there were a lot of analysis of the limitations of Bayes' theory and traditional conditional probabilities. And we had our own model called certainty factors in the early Meissen work. The internist had something called evoking strengths. Um, and now throughout the 1980s, as computers got more powerful, you, you were able to depart from the more naive Bayesian models. And we saw the introduction of Bayesian belief networks and influence diagrams and the like. So there's been a lot of evolution of the whole topic of uncertainty in artificial intelligence and how it can best be managed. Much of this work was influenced by efforts to understand how human beings solve the same problems. Here's a book on medical problem solving that was very influential at the time, written by Elstein, Schulman, and Spravka. Um, uh, there was also uh, uh, important work done uh, by uh, Kassir and Kuypers, who uh, did psychological studies uh, of uh, clinicians solving problems. Kassir, a physician at Tufts, who went on to be an editor of the New England Journal and Kuypers uh, at MIT, who was a computer scientist now on the faculty of the University of uh, Texas in Austin. Uh, there was simulation work done in a particularly influential paper that was published in the American Journal of Medicine about what's going on in the minds of a physician when they take a history from a patient and are trying to figure out what questions to ask next. Uh, and uh, I can refer you to that paper for a lot of um, uh, more information about that topic. Uh, which uh, is still very relevant today as we try to understand and model uh, the human approach to these problems. If you looked at a textbook uh, of artificial intelligence in those days, the emphasis of what AI was about was reasoning symbolically, acquiring and applying knowledge, and being able to manipulate and communicate ideas. Okay, So this concept of knowledge being the key of AI uh, 
has, has really evolved tremendously. And as we get into the more recent years, the emphasis is much more on data than on the knowledge, uh, largely because of the exploding capabilities of machine learning. So we'll talk about that a bit more as I proceed, but because I feel that we've left knowledge and knowledge encoding behind at our peril, uh, and it comes up fairly often in uh, the, the modern uh, world of AI uh, as it's applied in medicine. In those days, there was a big exploding interest in AI because of the expert systems phenomenon that occurred. Uh, it was, uh, there was this book by Feigenbaum and others uh, there was uh, adoption of AI, uh, 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 researchers uh, working in companies uh, to try to see how AI might help them enhance their business models and their products. There were cover stories in the major journal, uh, magazines, news magazines, and newspapers. Um, but there was something that happened in the 80s and 90s that's frequently been called AI winter. This was the disappointment that ultimately uh, developed about uh, uh, the failure of AI to at least uh, as rapidly as had been predicted live up uh, to its impact. Uh, there was a perceived overselling of AI as the solution and ultimately researchers who wanted to get funded found they had to avoid using the term to describe what they were doing even though they often were working in very similar areas to, to what we would call AI simply because it had fallen a bit out of favor. And it, there have been actually two peaks that have been described for the, uh, the hype phenomenon or the hype cycles uh, in AI, one that occurred in the late 70s uh, when things had been going rather well. This one didn't affect medicine too much because this is actually the period during which the medical AI was taking off. But medical AI was impacted by this second peak that was kind of the post-expert system enthusiasm. Uh, but I, I uh, hasten to point out that since then, the, uh, the trajectory for interest in and uh, enthusiasm for AI has been going up since uh, the early 1990s uh, without much of a drop. And the question is, is there another uh, episode of AI winter coming? Uh, it's looking less and less likely to me, but those of us who've lived through this uh, are aware that we need to be careful not to overpromise uh, and, uh, and, and, and make too simplistic assumptions about what the impact of the discipline will be over time. Um, by the 1990s, technology and interest in technology was driving the lay press and public uh, attitudes. Uh, you know, a very young Bill Gates on the cover of Time magazine uh, uh, in the mid 90s. And this same enthusiasm carried over within a decade into the medical world where there was more and more interest in what the role of technology computing would be, not necessarily just AI, but, but in general, the computers in medicine uh, and the interest in informatics as a discipline. And then in the early uh, part of this century, uh, after uh, increasing enthusiasm regarding uh, machine learning as computers got more powerful and it was more realistic to actually do some uh, significant learning work. Uh, we saw the development uh, of uh, the deep learning concept. Uh, uh, University of Toronto, of course, as most of you are aware, and uh, uh, Google's impact uh, and uh, uh, the ability to take advantage of the increasing automation of electronic of, of health records as they move from these kind of rows of paper uh, records into a digitally stored uh, data about um, uh, for given institutions, thousands of patients, but uh, you know, regionally and nationally, millions of patients with all the questions that are therefore raised about uh, uh, the pooling of data, the control of data, the ownership of data uh, and the like. So I wanna talk about medical decision support, clinical decision support for much of the rest of my time. Um, and I'm going to try to categorize the types into three major categories. Uh, those of you who are in the data science area will see uh, opportunities for data science, certainly in the first and third of these. Uh, in fact, much of what we know about uh, 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 
uh, machine learning and its impact in medicine is in this first category. Let me explain it diagrammatically. The notion here is that uh, you get data. It might, might come from a measurement device of some sort. Uh, there is a model that has been created using perhaps machine learning. So it allows uh, that software and that algorithm to produce an interpretive report about it, this new case. This is delivered to the clinician um, and typical sources of such data are looking at electrocardiograms or electroencephalograms, X-ray images, uh, any microscopic image uh, or photograph, uh, pathology, hematology, uh, retinal images, for example. Um, and getting, getting an interpretation of these, the clinician can verify uh, by looking at the same data, uh, whether they agree with the interpreta interpretation report and incorporates it into their decision-making process. This approach where the clinician gets to see both the recommendation and the primary data is pretty well accepted now. Um, uh, they may have first have some kind of human expert review what came out of the program, uh, but the clinician ultimately decides how to use the result. And uh, we've had uh, this kind of uh, use of interpretive uh, software going back many years. Here's an old 12-lead uh, uh, electrocardiogram uh, uh, of the sort that any physician is familiar with seeing. Comes out of a machine, and for the last 30 years or so, they have included uh, an interpretation of the cardiogram uh, as is shown in this example, these uh, interpretations uh, are generated using some kind of software. In this case, it's really not AI. It's, uh, it's, it was a, uh, a Fourier transform anal analytical software signal processing approach. Uh, but uh, uh, you could look at the EKG yourself and you could look at the interpretation, see if it made sense to you. And if you agreed, and if not, you might want to get another opinion or something, but people accepted this without saying, you know, convince me that this is correct. Uh, and more recently, we're seeing these deep learning programs that are doing this kind of thing. Uh, uh, here's uh, a paper from a few years ago that got a lot of press because it showed uh, remarkable performance uh, uh, of, a tr of a trained deep learning system uh, in interpreting and identifying diabetic retinopathy and other uh, eye diseases from retinal images. So this is one, um, one kind of, uh, of a clinical decision support system. And as we move on, I just want to leave you with a thought and maybe it's good for discussion later. And that is, to what extent is the model that has been generated by uh, the, uh, the deep learning analysis of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, retinal images, to what extent is that model or algorithm knowledge about the field? Second big category where AI has played a lesser role is in the general area of event monitoring and alerts. How do these work? Well, these are, the, these are pretty well accepted now. You have some kind of repository of clinical information about a patient. Typically, nowadays, this would be an electronic health record. Um, there's some kind of interface to the clinician that they use for either uh, entering orders or and, and typically for reviewing the patient's data. Uh, physician uses that directly, as they do in EHR. But you can have event monitoring software that's watching what gets added to the electronic health record, uh, watches it guided by a knowledge base of some sort that watches, for, it could be rules, that watches for a given situation. Uh, and when it arises, make sure that the interface to the clinician can deliver uh, that warning or alert uh, based on that rule uh, to the clinician. And the clinician usually can tell uh, by glancing at the alert whether or not this is relevant for the, the patient that they're seeing. Typical simple rules of this sort are things like, you know, if a patient's receiving digoxin and they have a low potassium, then you might want to warn the physician to require uh, some replacement of potassium to, to decrease the chance of an adverse uh, toxicity. Uh, and that's just by looking to see if a patient up here has got both evidence that they're taking digoxin and a lab result of potassium that is low, which would trigger this rule. 
So those are well, well accepted, don't require a lot of explanation. The third category is direct consultation with the user who's a clinician. The clinician is using the program themselves and, uh, and uh, getting advice from the program. And this is an area where there's a lot of challenges uh, and that's what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of my time. In direct uh, consultation with a clinical user, the model here is there's some kind of a tool that is designed to give advice to doctors typically, or other health professionals. And some kind of analytical method is used, could be uh, rules, it could be a scoring function that generated uh, through uh, machine learning, it could be a purely statistical system of some sort. But the doctor uses uh, that system to get an assessment of their case um, and taken this way, this is a standalone consultation system where the physician has to describe their patient uh, so that the analytical methods can be applied to their patient's data. Uh, usually doctors don't like that very much, but the, the work I described earlier, internist and, and CASNET and uh, Mycin, all were based on this model of direct consultation. And that's largely because we didn't have EHRs or networking or integrated systems in those days. But if you have a repository in the EHR, then you don't need to enter the data because the data are available over here, right? Uh, coming from uh, the electronic health record. And therefore you can request an assessment based on those data and maybe a few questions that would be sent to you that aren't in the EHR, but generally a lot of it would be here. But remember, this EHR already has an interface uh, to the physician that the physician uses. So maybe it would be better to deliver uh, the uh, advice from this advisory tool through the same interface that the clinician uses when they're accessing the, the patient's record uh, in much the same way that warnings and alerts in the previous model were being presented. Um, this has been called, when the doc uses it up here, the Greek oracle model, and it's pretty much been totally uh, eliminated from consideration. It just doesn't work. Doctors won't do it. They're, it breaks up uh, their workflow. And this integrates with the workflow to the extent that their workflow includes interactions uh, with a computer anyway, then the, the delivery in this context can potentially be made um, straightforward and acceptable although there are many other issues that determine the acceptability of this interaction. Um, and this is the preferred model. These are ki kind of the issues that we're gonna talk about. And uh, one of the reasons I've been thinking about this a lot is because I've realized that the impact of this kind of decision support is based upon much more uh, than simply the quality of the advice that it gives. So let's talk about that. I wrote it up in a little article in the Journal of the American Medical Association as a viewpoint a few years ago. Um, it, uh, I think, is having an impact. It's getting uh, a lot of citations as people think about the issues that we raise, so I'm gonna share them with you. The first is, if you're gonna ask a physician to take the advice that the computer has generated, you better be able to explain why the computer thinks that that's the appropriate diagnosis, therapy plan, whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, you can think about clinical systems you know and the extent to which they're able to provide that kind of logical explanation. Uh, the second is one of time. Nobody is going to spend a whole lot of extra time uh, interacting with the computer system in the busy clinical environment, so there is the notion of being sensitive to workflow and trying to make darn sure that the way in which the interaction occurs is as seamless as possible and has uh, ideally negligible, but certainly very little impact on the total time for interaction. The third is the, therefore, and because this has to do with the, the ability to use a system quickly, is just how usable and intuitive is it? Uh, one of my biggest criticisms of uh, a lot of products that I've seen, including EHRs, is that they have not gone through adequate analysis of the, of the need for excellent usability uh, 
usability testing before it's released, working with potential users to fully understand the kind of constraints and preferences that they're likely to bring uh, to the interaction with the system. Um, and we know that this is crucial. If we don't do it right, people won't use the system. Uh, design does not drive behavior. Uh, people vote with their feet. Uh, and this, uh, this little tongue-in-cheek diagram, uh, on the other hand, makes it very clear. No matter what the guys making the sidewalk wanted, the user is going to go where the, it's most logical for them to go. So usability, user design uh, uh, are, are crucial. Another one is just, does the, does the system seem to really understand the domain in which you're asking for advice? Are there things that just make you su suspect that it is limited in its abilities? And this can happen. Uh, you know, those of you who uh, are male and have been asked after stating that you're male to a computer program, whether you might be pregnant, uh, know that this program wasn't well designed. It just shouldn't even ask that silly question. Uh, I've always liked this cartoon for making it clear how challenging it can be to have a computer seem to really understand the world. Um, I think almost all of you should be able to make the diagnosis for why this patient has come to see the doctor. Uh, the doctor is using a computer that says rapid pulse sweating, shallow breathing, according to the computer, you've got gallstones. I think you all know that's wrong, but the computer had never heard of this particular diagnosis and wasn't going to be able, uh, therefore, to deal with it well. The next has to do with this whole issue of uh, delivering knowledge in a way that is respectful to the user. Um, uh, do we, in fact, want to give the impression that the computer is beginning to be the doctor? Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a cover of AI magazine from the 1970s or early 80s, uh, probably early 80s, uh, which I, I've cut out and saved ever since because even then the notion of AI in medicine had people concerned about computers taking over, dominating, losing that kind of specialized contact they want with their clinician. Uh, and uh, that can't be the model. Uh, uh, that comes across from the program either. Uh, and so there is this, some of you will have seen this before, uh, Chuck Friedman from the University of Michigan wrote an article that tried to emphasize that the fundamental notion of decision support and informatics uh, uh, in, uh, in clinical decision making is not that the computer is better than the human brain, but that the human brain augmented by the computer can be better than the human brain itself. And that has to be very much part of the philosophy that comes across to a user if they're going to make good use of this kind of system. But now I wanna talk about something that I think is way too overlooked. And that is the evidence that is gathered to demonstrate that this program uh, is worth using, investing in, et cetera. Um, if you think about the way in which we decide to adopt new medications as clinicians, yes, there's this issue of um, FDA and regulatory approval, but there's also the issue of um, publications in the peer-reviewed literature. The science is important to the clinicians. They want to see the data. They want to see true evidence. Uh, and yes, hopefully there'll be regulatory approval as well. But if you think about almost all the papers that have been written about clinical decision support evaluations that have been published, even in the clinical literature, they have been in experimental settings. And there's some that are in actual use, but I'm going to talk about why even those maybe have been uh, not thought through well. There are all these things you have to do to evaluate your program if it's actually going to be used by clinicians in actual patient care settings. Let's talk about them in two segments. One, there's what you can do during the design and development stage, uh, which we might call our, uh, our laboratory work. It's the, it's the retrospective work. It's not used prospectively on real patients. So you can do the, you know, the validity of the advice. That's what the internist one uh, uh, verification was and the Meissen paper that appeared in, the, in JAMA. Uh, 
Uh, you can even do formal usability testing and should, but that needs to be done with people of the sort that are going to be your eventual users. So you have to bring in collaborators and potential users early on to really do this well and to think about how it's going to integrate with, with the workflow and, and just the, the, the reliability of the technologies themselves. This is what most companies do when they're trying to commercialize a system. But the actual goal of all this is to have an impact on patient outcome. That's why you do this. And you're not, you're not evaluating that here. That has to be done in the real world, in the naturalistic setting. And before you can determine if it has an impact on patient outcome, you really have to first demonstrate that it's actually acceptable to users, that they use it. So you make it available, you give you know, pep talks and you encourage them and you hope that they're gonna see value immediately. Uh, but if you can't show that it's acceptable to users, there's no point in going on. If you show that they'll use it, then the question is, do they use it? And then does it make them do anything any different from what they were doing before? So the impact on user behavior is a separate question that can only be asked after you've shown that it's acceptable to the users in the first place. And only if you can demonstrate that their behavior is changing because of it, can you look to see whether or not that's positive change in behavior that over time has an impact on patient outcome. And this can take a long time. These are typically clinical trials that may go on for some years. And only after that's been proved, is it worth doing the obvious additional question, which was it all worth it? There's an expense involved with all this. Uh, is the outcome and the impact on patient outcome worth the expense? So there's some implications of this. Commercialization of clinical decision support systems requires this kind of a staged evaluation plan and could take a very long time. Early adopters that help you in that lab setting become natural partners in the evaluation studies after you move into the naturalistic setting as well. And in the current decade, let's look at AI in the context of everything I've been saying up until now. I wanna finish up here quickly so we have some time. Um, look, we all know there's been an explosion of interest in AI broadly and in medical AI in particular, there's a tremendous amount even in the lay press about medical AI these days. But there is a confusion in terms. Um, AI, machine learning, data analytics, data science, these are not synonyms. Um, you know, machine learning has always been a subfield of AI. Data science clearly is highly related to machine learning and therefore is often linked to AI. Data analytics is probably best seen as a name for statistical and, mean le and machine learning applications uh, that try to do um, uh, the, the kind of, uh, of uh, assessments that I've been uh, describing today. Uh, but there are other potential approaches as well. Uh, my view is that deep learning is too often viewed as the full solution. Oh, we've got it. Look at this incredible performance. But I would ask you, what does a deep learning program really know when it's performing well? What have you learned about the knowledge of the field from that program? Um, this raises the issue of explainability, and, and this is a big area for research in uh, the machine learning uh, arena, uh, and uh, is a potential opportunity for merging some of our traditional knowledge representation methods from the past uh, to augment and uh, facilitate our ability to explain what's going on in a deep model. Now, many of the early challenges that were identified 30, 40 years ago still persist. Uh, how best to integrate these systems into workflow, interoperability across uh, different um, EHR systems, for example, uh, especially uh, if there's not adequate standardization of terminology, which is these programs tend to be very dependent upon, who owns the data, and many others that I'm sure you've heard of and are familiar with. So I, I've given examples that I hope can drive home one of the main things I hope that all students think about. And that is that when you're working on a problem in biomedicine using informatics methods, including AI, um, you almost always have to do something novel in order to get the system uh, to behave and, and perform the way you want it to. That is a potential scientific contribution if that novel method is fed back into the literature appropriately. We need to convey 
how a contribution that we invent in one setting generalizes and can be used on other problems and what the range of applicability of that uh, methodology might be. Uh, and the reason uh, that, that I think that the AI in medicine of the 70s did have the impact it did was because they were, those programs were written up in ways that showed how the methods could generalize and be used um, beyond medicine and, and the specific problems for which they were developed. So I close with these key lessons. Um, try not to be too quick to reject the knowledge is power aphorism. Uh, incorporate an understanding of how human beings, and especially experts, solve the problem. I don't think that that is uh, something we should be ignoring just because we have these remarkable machine learning tools. Promulgation and acceptance of medical AI solutions is going to depend on much more than decision making or analytic performance. It's all these other issues that I pointed out besides just to, to make the right decision uh, that are important for actually having impact. Uh, the importance of collaboration. Uh, many people who get into this field come without medical backgrounds, but to do reasonable work that has real impact, they have to work closely with people that understand the medicine and the biomedical world. And yet the future is bright. We just have to remember that we're just in midstream as we were in the 1970s. Much more is coming in the years ahead. And we shouldn't think that anything that we're working with today is the final word uh, on, the, on the subject. So I thank you uh, for your time there. I will turn off the uh, screen sharing and uh, be happy to take questions.